football, past and present. He played over 850 times for his club, won 44 caps for Scotland and scored one very special goal. Today, we are joined by the greatest ever Ranger, Mr John Gregg, MBE. John, you were born and brought up in Edinburgh as a Hearts fan. Why Rangers? Well, quite simply, uh, my three older brothers were all Hearts supporters. And I naturally followed their near footsteps supporting the Hearts when I was a kid. Hearts, wa Hearts watched me that often, uh, but decided that I was too small. So uh, when my brother, my brother didn't even tell me, they just as a guy arrived at the door on a Sunday morning, and I ended up signing the form, and it was for Rangers. Uh, and my brother played a bit of football, so... So you'd have gone to Hearts if you had the opportunity in there? I'd have gone, for, I'd have gone to Hearts when I was a kid, yeah. Uh, but I was a small ball-playing inside forward. I know you'll not believe that, but... <laughs> uh, I was a small ball-playing inside forward in those days, and uh, I'd played for the Edinburgh schoolboys and everything, inside forward. But I wasn't very big, and... But the, the, the Rangers scout had taken the trouble to go and look at my, my brothers and sisters and see what height they were, and... Uh, when Rangers signed me, I wasn't too happy when they signed me actually, but a week later they played against the Hibs at Easter Road and beat them 6-1 in the League Cup game. Uh, and anybody that could beat the Hibs 6-1 was a, obviously me being a heart supporter was, was great as far as I was concerned. So from that, a week later, from that day on, I was, that was, that was me, Rangers supporter. So what age were you at that time, John? I was about 16 and a half. And so Rangers had never had you at Ibrox for trials or anything. It was just a scout watched you and then just signed you directly for Rangers. Yeah, well, when you're a good player, you don't need trials. <laughs> 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 no, uh, he'd watched me a few times playing for my juvenile team because uh, the game was different in those days. You know, there, was, there wasn't a youth development thing and all the rest of it. But uh, I'd played uh, in Edinburgh because Wee Willie Henderson was playing for Edinburgh Athletic, which was another... Uh, Edinburgh juvenile team. I had left my boys club and went to a team called the Dyna Hearts because 10 of them had signed for the Hearts and I thought it was another shortcut to get to Tyne Castle but as I say uh, that didn't come that didn't come uh, through and uh, I was only too pleased at the end of the day I realised I'd, I'd, I'd made the right decision uh, very very early uh, because I wouldn't who would turn down a club like Rangers? What was your first day like walking into Ibrox then? Well, I, I had never been as far west as Glasgow, except when I played at Cathkin against Alec Ferguson for the, the Edinburgh schoolboys and against the Glasgow schoolboys. And they brought me through one winter night to meet Scott Simon. And when the car stopped outside the stadium and I got out and looked up and somebody says to me, this, this is it. I, I, I mean, I'd never seen anything like my life before. And I walked in the Marble Hall and everything. It, it was just unbelievable. And he basically signed me that night, officially, but was leaving me with my boys club, with Dyna Hearts, until the end of that season. So, and I came through two nights a week after that to train with the part-timers uh, at Ibrox. So I, I was about five or six months training at Ibrox on a Tuesday and Thursday night. And old Jock Shaw, the famous Jock Shaw, used to give me a run up and down to the, the station uh, to go home and get my train back to Edinburgh. So. It wasn't for another six months before I came as a professional. And then I was a few months as a part-time professional and I went full-time. And did you sit down with Scott Simon on your own to negotiate this new contract <laughs> when you went full-time? Sit down, you joke him. No, uh, uh, I signed the, 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 the professional form and I was to be two nights a week training and then playing what they had was a third team in those days. Um, and they only played friendly games because there's no league for them to play in. Uh, and after a few months, he sent for me one Thursday night, I think it was, and I wondered what I'd done wrong. I was only there a few minutes. You didn't, you didn't go up the staircase in those days. So he, he, he said to me, he says, look, I've had good reports and I think it'd be beneficial if you went full time. So I said, well, I'll have to go home and speak to my father and my brother about it. I said, I, I can't just take that decision. Because I, I was working as an apprentice engineer in those days um, and hating it. But uh, I, I came back on a Tuesday night and I agreed to go. To go. So he says to me, he says, how much of my pay is a part-time player, John? I says, six pound, boss. He says, how much are you getting as an apprentice? I says, two pounds, ten shillings, two pound fifty. So he says, okay, he says, I'll give you six pound a week. 
So I basically went for a part-time player uh, to a full-time player for a, an additional 50 pence a week. So there was no negotiations at all, you just accepted what... Yeah, well, I didn't came. negotiate, no. But, but, and I, oh, I, I beg your pardon, before, when I was coming professional, he handed me two £10 notes as a sign-on fee. And he took one of them back off me, because I was standing looking at him, because I had never seen one £10 note in my life, <laughs> never mind two. So he, he took one off me and gave it to my older brother, and he says, I know that you were responsible for him coming here. So, uh, so your brother was your agent? So he's my agent now. So he got the £10 uh, for taking the shift of his work, and I got £10, which I gave to my old man. And, uh, and that, was, that was it. But, I mean, from that day to this day, playing football for Rangers was, wasn't about money for me. It was, it was what I wanted to do in my life, and uh, I was treated well by the club, and it was never ever about... I mean, I probably, like a lot of international players, I, I could have went to England on several occasions, but... I had, no, I had no wish to do it. I was happy. I was playing for a great club and I didn't feel any need to move. Uh, and my first, actually, my first day as a full time player, I passed the ball back and forth with Ian McCall, who a few years later was the Scottish manager who gave me my first international cap. So I always felt it, I always felt it was a, a privilege to play for a club like Rangers because uh, I made the point of looking into the history books and looking at the players who I knew all the Hearts players. That I played for in the early days, and I thought it'd be interesting to see the Rangers players. And I read up about Willie Waddle and Alan Morton and guys like that. Bob McPhail. Bob McPhail was the, in charge of the second team in those days, so it was steeped in history, and it was like it was some great household names that uh, I was following. So, what position were you playing at the time then? I was playing as a well, number eight in my back, which was a, an inside forward, which is you, you you fetched and carried basically uh, from the defenders to the forwards and I was very very fortunate that um, we had a magnificent second team the second team that I went into uh, but I was asked I was asked to deputise for the wee Prime Minister who was because he was called Dean McMillan after the, the actual Prime Minister of Great Britain was called Dean McMillan and um, they, they called him the wee Prime Minister a fabulous wee player that Rangers had bought towards the end of his career from Airdrie and Ian, they didn't want to play Ian two games a week type of thing so I, I, got, I got a game in this position. I, I wouldn't say I was the most uh, like him and the way we played or that but uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a great experience for me, it gave me a chance because if I'd been playing as a centre forward or an inside left for instance with Jimmy Miller and Alfie Brandt, it would have been far harder to get in the team because they were younger players. So it was, it was a wee break and I think that's very important in the game. Apart from not having the desire to play and having the ability, I think you've got to get the right break at the right time uh, with certain clubs. Tell me your family's reaction. I know your brothers were saying that talking about going to Rangers, but big Hearts fans through there were they behind you? Did they start to come to Irox to watch you play? No. no. The, the only person that came to see me was my brother that helped me to sign because uh, two of my other brothers didn't really bother, um, but. Uh, he came a couple of times to see me. He, he, he used to come to Easter Road in Tyne Castle because we didn't have cars and we I mean, didn't have a car in those days. Uh, didn't have a telephone. Uh, I lived in a tenement building. Um, so and I've always, it, I think that was good because it kept your feet in the ground. I've always tried to be like that. Uh, but he, he, he stopped going because he got into a, he got into a, a problem at uh, Easter Road one day when this guy called me something <laughs> that he didn't like. And he, he threatened the guy and he says to me, I'm not going back. He says, I don't want to get you embarrassed. So he didn't go. He, 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 he died very early, so he didn't see a lot of my career. My father used to want to go, but he, he was as blind as a bat. You know, I was going to get my job as a scout when I became the manager, but, <laughs> but uh, he was as blind as a bat. And, but he just liked to tell the guys in the pub, I was at the game today, you know. And I remember when I won my first... Uh, Play the year award for the sports writers. I took him to that along with my brother. And the worst thing that ever happened was Scott Simon says to him, If you ever want a ticket, don't worry, don't even bother asking him, just just come to me and I'll get you a ticket. And every Friday night he used to say to me, and he, when he came in for the pub, Am I going to the game tomorrow? I says, No. He says, I'll just phone Scott up and ask him for that ticket. And, no, he used, to, he used to threaten me every night, but every Friday night. But no, I was good. But, but no, the, my family didn't pay. My, Jeanette, my wife, went to all the games because I met Jeanette when I was 18, I think, and uh, we went about the beach for a few years. But she went to all, all the games, basically, in those days. Uh, so I'd always 
Some support. Is Jeanette from Edinburgh, Glasgow? No, she's a bonus. Bonus. At the beginning of your Rangers career, who, who did you learn most from? I learned most from Jimmy Miller and Alfie Brand because I had, again, the, the tremendous advantage over a lot of play, young players that I travelled every day in the train with them. So, travelled every day in the train with, with and, and Billy Stevenson as well at the beginning of the time. And we travelled through every morning on the 8.30 train. We used to travel through when it was a steam train. Uh, and then it, it, it went on to, to become the diesel and I got to frighten my life one day because my brother that had sent me to Ibrox was a driver, he was, a, he was an engine driver on the railway and he was driving the train one morning. So, <laughs> but a great, a great, a great uh, experience was, um, we used to go off the train and walk down to the one way street in Glasgow, Hope Street comes up the way, I don't know what the street has gone down the way, but we used to stand outside this furniture shop and wait in a 54 bus going to Crookston. And there was Jimmy Muller, Ralphie Brand and Jimmy Baxter and myself. And I just wonder today if you get four players like that with that standard standing waiting for when, a, when did that a all 54 stop, bus. When, when did that all we stop? Did that, we, well, we did that for quite a fair bit of our careers. Even uh, when you were like, oh, establishing was, the first team? I, I, we were a first team players. I mean, we were, Jimmy Baxter was an inter, in, in, international team. I was an international team in doing that. I, I, I stayed with my mother and father in that tenement building until was, till was, till the day I got married. And by that time, no fans were giving you any hassle no, at all, no? I, I mean, well, we had one or two wee skirmishes in Queen Street Station once or twice when Jimmy, Jimmy Miller in particular was a bit hot-headed and they chased a guy all the way down Buchanan Street and <laughs> kicked, kicked him up the back, and back side, you know? Because <laughs> uh, the guy says he was, he was hopeless and that, you know, but Jimmy, Jimmy caught up with him and... I mean, nowadays you get put in jail for it. Doesn't it take him much, does it, saying he's hopeless to him and that's him reacting? Oh, Jimmy, <laughs> that, oh, oh, Jimmy was my best man at my wedding, so I knew... I knew him better than most people, but uh, but if you did things like that nowadays, you would get jailed yeah. or about about a sensational news in the papers or something. But no, we we, we the, the 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 worst experiences, well, not the worst, the probably the most intimidating ones was in those days you used to run special trains to the games, and invariably, if we got off the train on a Saturday going to Ibrox, there'd be a train going to maybe Dunfermline or Edinburgh with the Celtic supporters on it. And there used to be hundreds and hundreds of Celtic supporters in Queen Street Station. And Jimmy used to say, we're not going around there, just walk straight towards them. And they parted, they parted <laughs> and let us through, you know. Uh, we got a few insults, but... Uh, what was your first old firm game, John? What was the build-up to that? I think, most, I think my first old firm game was a New Year's Day game, very, when I was quite young. And I had, I'd been... I'd been uh, Injured and not playing in any, any of the teams for about four or five weeks with a bad back. So my wife, well, my, my, my wife now says to me, why don't you come down to Bowness and see in the new year? Uh, you don't get a chance because you're a football player. So I said, okay. So I, w I went down and I was, I was going to stay with my future mother-in-law. But I uh, we went across to this guy's house at five past twelve and I had half pint shandies and... Uh, I left it left about four o'clock in the morning and went back to the, my mother-in-law's. Then I had to get up about half past nine or ten o'clock to, to get a train because it was all funny trains and services in those days. Um, and I was sitting in the front hall with all the young players at Ibrox and Scott Simon come down the stairs and he says, uh, Happy New Year, Willie. Happy New Year, Tam. Happy New Year, Johnny. He says, You're wearing the number eight today. I says, Boss, I says, I've, uh, I've not been playing. I says, I'm injured. Uh, but he says, the ground's bone hard, and there was no undersoil heat in those days. He says, the ground's bone hard, and Ian McMillan can't play in that surface, Johnny. He says, you were the number eight. So I waited till he got to the end of the line, and he turned his back, and I shot straight through the dressing room, and I sat there for an hour. I, I, I literally just... Oh, well, I can't tell what I did, but uh, you can imagine. <laughs> uh, and we went out, and I scored a goal, we won 4 nothing. And did you know then about how big coming from Edinburgh, how big a, an old firm game was? Because obviously, as a kid, you were looking at the Hearts Hibs game as a massive yeah. derby match. What was it like coming through and playing in one in the uh, West Coast? Well, you learn very quickly, but I mean, uh, I must tell you a, a story about when I, when I was training twice a week at Ibrox, I used to, I worked as an engineer, as I told you, and I, and I, was, put, I was sent through to work in Tenants Brewery in Duke Street for six weeks. And we were supposed to stay in digs at the back of Duke Street, and I didn't like them. So we decided to get the train through every morning, at quarter past six in the morning. And I would go to the Ibrox the two nights for my training. 
But as I say, I was getting two pounds fifty pence as an engineer, and I was getting—I was only getting a pound a week for Rangers then because I was a, I wasn't a professional player. But the guy I was wor working with for Edinburgh told the, the tradesman in Queen Street in Tenants Brewery we were, what, what I was going to be doing. I was going to play for Rangers. So the second day I was there, they came, came, came to me at lunchtime and said, uh, "They tell me you play a bit of football." I said, "Uh huh." He says, well, come on across and kick the ball. I said, at lunchtime, he says, we kick the ball across the road. So I went across and I just had a pair of jeans on and a pair of shoes and working shoes. And I didn't know what to show off and that, you know. <laughs> and, uh, the guy came across to me and he says, they tell me you've signed for Rangers. And I says, I have. He says, you're effing hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Glasgow humour. So on the Friday, for the same, the first week, I went into the canteen because we couldn't go and play football. And... I got haddock and chips and ice cream and fruit salad and I didn't have much money in my pocket because I didn't have a lot of money to spend. And I put it down and being a good Edinburgh boy, I was taking the tray back to where I got it. When I came back, my haddock and chips had disappeared. So I started to panic because I was, I was hungry and I didn't have any more money. So I says, who's, who's this? And the boy says, Bobby Dixon's got it. And I knew that Bobby Dixon was an electrician that worked in tenants. So at the corner of my eye, I saw him coming towards me and he slapped his plate down in front of me and it was steak, pie, potatoes and peas and onions. And I don't like onions. And I says, Who's, what's that? He says, that's your son. I says, I don't like that. He says, well, you better eat. He says, because if you're going to play for Rangers, you don't eat fish on a Friday. And I thought, well, what the hell's he talking about? So when I went home at night, I asked my mother what he was, I had to ask my mother what he was talking about and she explained to me what the procedure was. And I, I, and, and I, never knew the, I, knew, I never knew the first thing about religion or anything. It didn't bore me. <clears throat> Still doesn't bore me. But uh, that was my introduction into what it was going to be like in the west of Scotland. <laughs> Did you socialise with any of the Celtic no. players at that time? No, no. no I, 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 we didn't or the Edinburgh I, boys? I didn't. Jimmy Baxter used to socialise a few times, but Jimmy would socialise with anybody if they've got <laughs> the same pub. But as he was going to, but... Uh, no, I, 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 when I, I became the captain in 1965, uh, and Big Billy was a captain at Celtic by that time. And because we were the old firm captains, we had to do a lot of uh, appearances and different things together. So I've been, I've been close with Big Billy all these years, uh, and we've been quite friendly. And I've always, I've always been, on talking terms, and quite friendly with, with quite a few of the Celtic players. How did the captaincy come about? Well, we went through a period of time when it had been Eric Caldo for a long time, Bobby Shearer, uh, Jimmy Baxter for a, a short while. And I think Jimmy, I think it was when Jimmy Baxter left. I'm not quite sure uh, if it was Jimmy Baxter leaving or if Eric Caldo was re retiring or Bobby Shearer. I'm not quite sure, but these three were the latest in, that had been had been the captains. And Scott Simon just come up to me one day and he says, uh, "As from tomorrow, you'll captain the team." And um, he'd always been, he'd always said to me when he gave me the ten pound that he would look after me. And he did. Did you ever come into any direct battles with like Jinky Johnson at all? Oh, right. a Johnson. number, a number. But we, we Jimmy, we, uh, we, I got to know quite, uh, I spoke to quite a lot uh, in recent years. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, we Jimmy. But um, I got him well with we Jimmy. We, don't, we had a mutual respect for each other. Um, and especially at Celtic Park when, when I was playing left back at the end of my career. Uh, in front of the jungle, which I used to call that, but the, the enclosure, that bit over there, I used to call the jungle. And if, if, if I won the toss, I would deliberately shoot uh, to the Rangers' end. Yeah. And I'd, I'd, I'd very would be across there at the, uh, at the jungle when they were waiting for the game to start, and they used to give me pellets. <laughs> oh, me, Jimmy, used to stand and laugh at me. And I, I used to say to Jimmy, they think we're shouting it. I says, but I'm telling you now, if you go by me, keep going. Because if you come back, you know, you used to always come back and beat you four times. Aye. I says, I don't mind you beating the ones, but don't come back and do it again. <laughs> uh, we, used to, we used to laugh, you know. But, uh, we played in the hard ground there one day. Uh, it was bone hard. And they'd put down straw to try and keep the ground. But it was, it was brick hard. And it was, it was a, if you're a defender, you've got a wee bit more license to tackle people those days because you, your feet would slip. So they put all the straw at the side of the pitch. And I, I was melting me, Jimmy, at this straw. He was ending up in the straw. And 
Going off the pitch at half time, he was like, Where's all gummage? He's going to all he's, he's here, he's here, it's sticking to his jersey. Oh. <coughs> but great wee player, great, great wee player. Yeah, he always said he was crossed a good ball, but you crossed a good winger. That's right. <laughs> Aye, I, I used to put him quite a few times beside his company out of tickets in the stand. But uh, it was good, it was good fun. I mean, but when did that type of football come into your game, John? Because everyone now, any Rangers fan looking back, John Gregg was as hard as nails. Everybody did always say that. Were you hard when you got join Rangers, or did that come as you get a wee bit older? Well, I keep saying I was a ball player. I was a ball playing a ball player when I arrived at Ibrox, and it took them a month to knock it out of me. But I was only, <laughs> only, only kept them one. But no, I'll tell you what. I can't. I can't really blame Rangers for it because for changing me. Because when I played for my juvenile team, uh, we had a guy that ran the juvenile team who. Who, uh, he was actually a hard scout for a long time. An ex-player he was as well. But he used to say to me when I played against Willie Henderson's team, I'm going to move you from inside forward today back to right half to mark Alan Gordon. Now, Alan played with the same team as Willie Henderson. And Alan was a big, tall, slim guy like he, like he still is. And uh, he was good in the air. Uh, and he scored a lot of goals at juvenile level. And he says, I want you to sort them out early doors. If you sort them out early doors, I'll give you 30 bob, £1.50. Well, £1.50 was nearly what I was getting, up, getting for a wage as an engineer. <laughs> and that's awesome. So, so <laughs> I, I, I think that's where it started. He says, only says, I'll give you a lift home in my car. He had a big Jaguar. So I think that's maybe where I got this uh, aggressive style uh, of playing. To be fair, mate, I, I, I was a bad loser, so I yeah. wanted, to, wanted to win every game. So, and then when you went to Rangers, when, you went, when I went to Rangers, um, you, you had to you had to put, play 100 percent, or you wouldn't have been the team anyway. Any of the teams, because there was a lot of competition for places in those days. And if I if I stood back and look at it, if I was standing back and looking at it now, how could it not rub off a wee bit in me with playing in front of somebody like Harold Davis and Bobby Shearer? I mean, it had something had to rub off of me. Because I've never seen a winger go down there against these two in my life. <laughs> I mean, they were as hard as nails, eh, Pierre? Staying on that, I remember you told me a story, John, about uh, John Blackley. And you said he was the only one that ever really did you and got yeah. away with it because you never got a chance to get him back. He got me in the semi-final of the Scottish Cup at Hamden. It was about a week before we played Bayern Munich in the semi-final of the Cup Winners' Cup when we won it in 72. And he, he, he caught me in the turn and well, he whacked me. <laughs> what, what, I was, what I was angry about was I went to watch him play, in fact, as a kid. Because my nephew played with, me, with the Hibs when they, were two, when they were youngsters. And I knew John well. And ach, he's probably quite right, because I'd have done it to him. But uh, he went away to Newcastle and never got the chance to get him back. <laughs> but he'd, uh, he'd, he's a hard player, John. A uh, hard player. Going back to your reputation of being hard, was there anyone you'd look over your shoulder and just always be a wee bit wary of? Or did you feel as though... Everybody. Yeah? I mean, everybody... I mean, I, I, I could never... I never think I was of myself as being that hard, being that, that, just that, that inclined. I, 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 think, I think I was just like a lot of people. Uh, I would like to think that put more that were very, very competitive. Uh, and it was a physical game in those days. Anybody internationally? No, like there was spitting going on in those days and hard tackles, obviously, but anybody stick out internationally? No. Ah, Seville. So we played Seville in the European Cup at Ibrox, and I thought I was just I was playing the, in place of Ian. I was still <coughs> a kid, and I couldn't believe what they were doing to us at Ibrox. And I thought, what, God, what's it going to be like in Spain? And I was right in Spain. Uh, I, I mistimed a tackle with two minutes to go, and the referee, the referee blew his whistle, and there was a big punch up, and the referee abandoned the game. But uh, that surprised me a wee bit, you know. But um, it, Come back to what Murdo says, I, th I think I used to go in the philosophy that when you played abroad, the first thing you did when you went in the park, you hit somebody. Because, especially if it was the first game, because if, if, if they saw you doing that, they would wonder what you would do they would get when they go back to Ibrox. Mm -hmm. But the things you had to put up with, I mean, it's okay. People say, well, that's, that's a ridiculous statement. But they don't realise what you had to put up when you played abroad. You know, in those days, I mean, it was shocking some of the things you had to put up with. So I prefer to be stand up and be counted rather than sneak so, away and yeah. let them be, and, and cow, be cowardly about it. In your early days, you were winning the championships, winning cups. You must have been delighted with that kind of start. Yeah, because I was very fortunate to go into a fabulous team. 
the only changes in the team was Jim, uh, Billy Stevenson went away to Liverpool and Jim Baxter played and um, Alex Scott left to go to Everton and me Willie Henderson came in and I mean our second team as I said earlier was a great side because Scott Simon put three players in, Ronnie McKinnon, Willie Henderson and myself all from the second team straight into the first team and that's a big big bonus, I mean if you could do that nowadays it would it would save you millions uh, but we, we three young boys went to a really cracking team and in, in fact probably something which supports that is that a lot of the supporters nowadays will turn around and say that the team that played in 1963 was as good a team that ever played for Rangers and that was Richie Shearer, Caldo, myself, McKinnon and Baxter, Henderson, McMillan, Miller, Brandon Wilson. Uh, and a lot of people still to this day think that was a fabulous team. What was your greatest achievement as a player? And what was it like to lift the Cup Winners' Cup? Well, when you've played as long as I've played, it's difficult to answer your first part of your question. Uh, always in the back of my mind nowadays was the... I think the first day I played in the first team. My first ever game in the first team. Because I realised I was getting near <coughs> that dream I had from I'd been, like I saw when we were kids, to be a professional player. Uh, and I think that's, that was me seeing that there was a chance I could maybe do it now. I think when they made me captain, uh, particularly in line with the captains that had been, that had been in the club previous to me. Uh, captain of Scotland, uh, beating England at Wembley after they won the World Cup. Uh, you're saying about winning the Cup Winners' Cup in Barcelona. Uh, one of the worst times was captain the team in Nuremberg in 67 when we lost to Bayern Munich after extra time uh, so I think Barcelona was more of a celebration as far as I was concerned for the players supporters in the club because that was our third final as a club it was the second final some of us had played in and I think our supporters were, were due something like that the referee looking at his watch the Rangers fans just ready, almost panting here, waiting for this final whistle. Rangers three goals to two in the lead after being almost unassailable. The ball right up to Rangers' 18-yard line, charged down by Dave Smith. Dave Smith hard into the Russian half, too hard for any Rangers player to catch. It runs right through to the keeper, right outside his goal area. He goes, and it's all over! It's all over, and the, the invasion has started as the Rangers fans come dashing onto the park and the players have to scamper to get off it. And now when I got into the Rangers first team, I'd been in the club a year or so, uh, and I knew what it was like, I knew the expectations, I knew the kind of player we were playing with, um, and I knew how big the club was. Well, I, was I was still realising how big the club was. And to that, from that day to this day, I still think, because it's Rangers, we should be winning the treble every year. We should be winning the Champions League every year. That, that's, that's, that's my heart talking, it's not my head talking. But I just, felt, I just feel that um, that's the pride I've got in my club. Uh, if it was a smaller club, then obviously you'd have different feelings. But my ambition as a player in this club is always to win everything. And Celtic went in the nine in a row. What was the feelings within the club then? You would need to ask people like McCoy that, that because uh, they, they wind me up about that. <laughs> um, uh, obviously, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, <coughs> I would probably be bitterly, bitterly disappointed. But I can't actually put, put my, f my finger on one particular thing whereby I see it really affected me. Uh, it would hurt me because I hated getting beaten. Mm -hmm. But we beat Celtic a few times during these nine years, but it, it was to no avail. We would lose to somebody else or something else. Or we'd be beating them at half time and we'd come out in the second half and Jock Steen had made a tactical change and we lost the game in the second half or something, something like that. Uh, but I think in, in maybe a, an unusual way, the nine years that Celtic won the league, probably in an unusual way, did, did more for me than maybe other things in my career. Because at that particular time, players of my stature at that particular time would have left. I mean, they would have gone to England like Jim Baxter and, and a host of others um, and played in England. It was, it was probably much more financially rewarding down there 
but that that was the that was the the way the people went in those days. The amount of Scottish players playing with English clubs was unbelievable. I had no re reason or wish to go do that, and I stayed. And the times changed, and it's like everything else with Rangers and Celtic nowadays. Each club will have a little bit of success and it'll come back. And if you're patient enough, it'll come round. If you can wait long enough, it'll come round. Some sit but it seemed a long time then. Uh, you ever, uh, during the nine years, did you ever feel, when's this going to end? No, because I felt it went down the next game. The following season, did you feel, well, we'll win it this year, we'll win it this no, year? No, I, 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 to be honest with you, I couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. But I, I, would, I would assume that the way I was, it would only last to the next match. Mm -hmm. Because I would think that the next match will change it all. We'll beat them and it will change again. But it, 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 uh, it, did, it did make winning after that well, you all the sweeter. Back, you came back. Yeah, we came back and stopped when it was trouble or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it made it all the sweeter, I think, after that. Because um, sometimes you've got to see the other side of the coin to appreciate the, the good things in life. As Billy touched on there, you're talking, he was talking about Barcelona. Recently you had the trip to Barcelona with all the, your old yeah. teammates. How, how was that? I think it was great for them. I'd been back a few years ago doing, my, doing a video, uh, which they asked me to do. So I'd been back to the stadium, but 11 players won that game that night, not me. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I always felt that I got a lot of publicity because of my beard and all the rest of it, and, uh, the, the game. But... And I always felt that because of the antics of the police after the game, the rest of the players never got the recognition they, they deserved for that. They never probably got the personal enjoyment out of it because I went away to a room smaller than this and got the cup. So it was, it was quite... It was very nice, actually, to walk up the, onto the park that night there in Barcelona with the rest of the guys. Uh, and there was quite a few supporters in the stadium and uh, it let the guys, it, was, it, it wasn't the same as 72, but at least it was a little bit uh, for them. And um, I was pleased for them. Um, and they thoroughly enjoyed it, you know, they, they thoroughly enjoyed the, the, the occasion. Voted the best ever Ranger. How yeah. did you feel when you get voted? Very humble and slightly embarrassed. To be honest with you, because when they, when they started that competition, I thought, what a load of rubbish that is. Uh, and we were in Parma. Is it Parma in Italy? Yeah. And these supporters came up to me and says, by the way, I'll vote for you. And I'll vote for you, John. And I thought, they must be taking this serious. Anyway, um, the, th the humbling thing for me was that, as I said earlier in this interview, there was guys in this club like, just to name a few, George Young, Bob McPhail, Davy Meikle, John, Alan Morton, Willie Waddle, you know, Jim Baxter. You could go through a load of people who were all magnificent names in the history of this club. Uh, and I think, personally, to take one out make, and, and individualise is wrong. I've always said that. Uh, but and, but when, they, when they picked me to, to represent that, 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 what they were calling it, uh, uh, how do you get a bigger accolade than that? Uh, no, it was, it's very, very humbling, but um, I'm, pleased about, I'm pleased to have it, but at the same time, I, I don't go about shooting about it, you know. <laughs> Did you ever at any point, John, be close to going to England to join an English team? Was there any, ever any negotiations? Well, it's okay for you young youngsters nowadays, you, you just say you didn't want to sign your contract and you're away. Look at how many clubs you had. <laughs> uh, he was the same. Freedom of contract. <laughs> guys like us had, had to do the fight for you guys. But the uh, wild boys, yeah. No, to be honest, I mean, uh, the interesting one was in, in the 60s, uh, Harry Catrick, who was the manager of Everton, wanted to sign me. And Everton was the top team in England then. And uh, he was a good pal. Of, he was a good pal of Scott Simons. And Scott Simon never told me a thing about it. And I t it's interesting how I found out about. Uh, I met Howard Kendall, who later became Everton's manager. And, and he, he told me a story. He says, um, "Thanks to you," he says, "I left Preston North End and joined Everton, and became the youngest player to play in an English Cup final at that particular time, uh, because uh, Rangers wouldn't let you go." I said, "Where to?" He says, "To Everton." 
He says, they came inside me because you, the Rangers wouldn't let you go there. And, that was, and that's how you found out in those days. Uh, and obviously there's people going about tapping you for newspapers and that, but I know it. But uh, in nine, I was 33 year old and Newcastle wanted me to go. Joe Mercer wanted me to go to Newcastle. Uh, and, and as I say, there was, there was others, but I didn't know, I didn't know where they were. Any they never told you. Would you like no. to have tried it? No. 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 I, I think in hindsight you say, well, it would be nice to have played there, nice to have played there, but um, no, I, I, was, I, I, I was captain of Rangers. Uh, as, as successful as a, man, as a player in the competitions, played in Europe. As I said earlier, going to England to uproot my family and go to England, what for? For money. In the introduction, John, we said about one very, very special goal you got for your country. I know yeah. you, you've, you've been asked a million yeah. times about it. It, it, it. it was a special goal, I think, on the night, but it didn't count for anything because we got beat. Bremner. Greg, he's never been out of your picks in the last ten minutes. Backstab. It's a goal! It's You know, the ironical thing about it was... I think if you check the records, in that qualifying for that 1966 World Cup, I was a joint top scorer with Dennis, Dennis Law, with two goals. <laughs> and the other goal I scored was in Finland, in Helsinki against Finland. And it was a far better goal than the, the t Italian one. Uh, it's, I mean, I, I can remember that one, but I can't remember much about the Italian one. It gave people that evening a lot of hope. And Hamden must have had half a million people in it that night. Because everybody keeps saying to me, by the way, I was at Hamden that night, you scored that goal. And I think, <laughs> Hamden wasn't as big as that, you know? But uh, I, think, I, I think it gave a lot of people a lot of hope because, to be honest with you, we had a lot of good players in the international team then. Yeah. And in all my international career, I never played in the European Championship finals or the World Cup finals. And I think, probably inwardly between our, the, the players, I think we felt if we could get to the finals in England, It'd be like playing at home. Uh, and with the calibre of player we had, I mean, we had Dennis, Billy Brenner, Jimmy Baxter, I mean, we had world-class players. Um, we could have, uh, we might have done something in the World Cup in England. But it wasn't to be. We got beaten Italy and uh, I think Poland. Was it Poland or somebody took points off us at Hamden? I can't remember, but it was 42 years ago. Just talking about Italy, what <clears> do you think <throat> for the weekend? Honestly, uh, I don't pay a lot of attention to the players in the international teams now because uh, I watch so many other games, the Rangers, I watch all the kids' games and all the rest of it. But I, I think the game, it's just a game of football. It's a game of football and it's 11 against 11. It's not as if Italy is going in the park with 15 players or something. And I think that uh, as far as the Scottish split players are concerned, is that if, if they have self belief and reputations, reputations are great, but you haven't won a game until the final whistle goes and you've scored more goals than the opposition. And I think if the Scottish players go out and, and don't show them that much respect, and go and, go and do what they're good at. Uh, with a, they've obviously got a lot of passion and uh, they'll have a, a fanatical support behind them. Uh, and I've never, I've never seen a team yet that doesn't panic a bit when you put them under pressure. And, and to be honest, I don't think the Italian team at this moment in time is as good an Italian team as has been in the past, but that's easy to say. Fantastic playing career then, 1978. Yeah. You get a phone call to take over as manager. Yeah, I knew, I knew, as soon as I heard that Joe Wallace had left, I knew I'd, be, I'd, I'd get the opportunity, well, in some way, because I was, I was nearly 36 years of age. I was only, I'd signed for an hour season, but I knew that uh, the way that Willie, Willie Woodall thought about me, that um, he, uh, there was a possibility I'd become the manager, yeah. You're, you're always still laughing, I joke. You're always like that, even when I was at Rangers. Did you, did you find it hard to distance yourself from the players just by becoming manager of players you'd played with? Probably you'd have to ask them, because it was... It was I was fortunate in one way that they were all senior professionals. There were, there was, was, there were very few young players there. Uh, they were all senior professionals who I'd played with quite a number of them for quite a number of years. So there was a, there was a mutual respect between us anyway. Uh, and the first year wasn't a problem at all because the, 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 they were great. They were absolutely, they were absolutely great, uh, easy to handle because I knew every one of them. Yeah. But it's like, it's like everything else. Uh, time, time's a terrible enemy 
Uh, you do have to change or you do have to Particularly for a football player though, because a football players get older as well. And, and that was happening because there was about six or seven of them over 30 years of age, which you start to become, it becomes a difficult situation. And how did you find getting into management? Was it a massive change for you? No, it was always what I wanted to do. I always wanted to be a manager after I stopped playing from a very, very early age because I was always very, very much tactically minded and uh, I always thought, that, always, always thought I'd go down that road. But after four and a half years uh, here, um, I didn't want to go anywhere else after that. I didn't want to keep doing it. I just chucked it. Best it is, I think I'd have been a better manager 15 years later. So you just fed up by the end, just, that's why you walked, just no, pressure? Actually, was well, it? one of the reasons I left is because... Because it's not like you to give up, that's no, I think, no, No, it was, affecting my, it was affecting my family too much. That was the main reason. Yep. And, and, and secondly, I thought that the club might be better by a change anyway, so it broke my heart, but that was it. And then when you left Rangers, you were doing a wee bit of the media side? I couldn't have believed after all these years, sitting watching two teams playing, uh, how different it was to watch them playing than the way they played against strangers. Mm. No, it was, it was un unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was good to go to see some games where, you know, you, you, you wouldn't have, I wouldn't have ever gone to the game if I, if I hadn't been working for the BBC. Going as a neutral? Yeah, good. Yeah. Just, just lo looking at the game and appreciating, appreciating good players and uh, appreciating the tactical side of the game that the different managers had. And Did you think you were learning more than just sitting as a side and... Just enjoying the... Well, I had to learn, I had to learn because I had to educate Dougie Donnelly on the TV. <laughs> uh, but, uh, no, it, it, it's, I, 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 even yet, I mean, I watched, I watched the Barcelona game last week and um, I learned from that, I learned things in that, which you can only learn if you're looking for them. Mm -hmm. you, you, I mean, I, I, people sometimes say to me, why are you, know, why are you looking at this end of the field? It's because the ball was at the end of the field, but I want to see how players are, yeah. where players are going and everything when the ball's at the opposite end of the park. Is that why you think you could have been, well, you maybe have liked a better shot uh, or a shot 15 years later to be a, a manager no, again? No, no, no. You, 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 there's, there's, there's one thing I've learned in football. Football's about today and tomorrow. It's not about what happened yesterday. And, and quite honestly, I'm surprised that I'm sitting here talking as long to you, Pierre, about things that happened 40 years ago. But, no, I, 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 um, I don't regret anything. I, don't, I made a big decision to go... I knew I was going to the game. I knew I was putting myself at the game. But it, that's why the, the BBC was a, great, was a great job for me because it took me out of the, the game as far as I wanted to go, but it kept my interest in the game. And, and how did you good. manage to get back into Rangers then after that? What was the <coughs> approach made to come back in? Yeah, well, Graham Souness and well, David Murray asked me to come back. And I said, well, as this is, well, we just want you back in the club and we'll, we'll find a job for you to do. But I, I insisted that I didn't want to get involved on the playing side of it because I didn't want anybody to turn around and say to me, who do you think you are? You know the manager nowadays, and that, you know. Uh, but I had a great respect for Graham and Walter because uh, I'd known Graham since he was a kid in Edinburgh. Uh, but I was forced into going more into it when Dick Advocat came back because uh, the chairman asked me to, to help him because he was the first foreign manager we had. And a simple thing like going into Easter Road, they wouldn't know where to go to the dressing room. That type of thing, you know, and he was a very private guy and a bit shy. So, but it, I really, really enjoyed my stint with Dick Advocat because um, it, 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 it pulled you right probably into rekindled, being part rekindled of the, the first that, team uh, Rekindled that... Uh, that's the thing that I had years ago, uh, and it gave me a chance to... Bert van Lingen basically only concentrated on training methods and, that, and, and, and writing books. Uh, I used to sit and talk to Dick about tactics and things and that. Yeah, there's no doubt Dick listened to you, no doubt. And individual players, we would discuss individual players and things. Um, and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed yeah. it. I mean, he's he's, he's a, a very good rela relationship with him. Ah, great. Well, he's really strong. Well, he, he used to... He, 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 he used me a lot and it was easy to work for him because he gave me a lot of respect and he, he, worked, he, he worked his socks off, you know. You, you, you learn for everybody, you know. You had discipline throughout your whole Rangers playing career with some tough managers. Oh, yeah. And Jock yeah. Wallace about the place as well. And uh, who would you put, who was the strictest, strictest of them all? Well, well, there's no doubt about that. Willie Waddle. Yeah. 
But I mean, Jock, Jock when they speak to you, Jock usually just hit you. <laughs> Jock just used to throw you against the wall. But uh, Willie Waddle was just, I mean, I, I, I was speaking to the boys last week and they would say, we go up to his office when they end their contract, and you guys will know, understand this, but at the end of your contract, you go up and the manager would say, you're right, your contract's up. What do you think? And you would say to him, uh, well, I think I deserve a rise. And he would wait, he would wait about a minute before answering you and say, well, just shut the door and the way out. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And they'd be signed for the next day. And then eventually we'd say, well, there's what you're getting. Sign it. Yeah. Oh, Willie, Willie Waddle was hard. He was, he was the strictest. Who was your favourite manager? The ball. I had a real affection for Scott Simon because he was the guy that signed me. I was bitterly disappointed about the way that he got sacked. Uh, and he took me to the station the night before, the night he got sacked. I was in a quiz ball thing at, in Glasgow. David White came in. I learned a wee bit about David because he was a, for a younger manager for a different club. Wally Waddle, Joke Wallace. And I had several managers at an international level. I went through a few managers at international level. In fact, yeah. I, I went through a right few. <laughs> <laughs> joke's team was obviously a different class. Yeah. I mean, big joke, big joke. You're talking about the Italy game. Big, that was the first time I'd ever played right back. And big joke says to me, he said, I want you to play right back tonight. And he, he made it quite simple. He wanted just want me to attack, because I had this attacking sense. But uh, big joke was a good manager. Uh, I can't, I'll never forget the return game in Italy when he spent an hour going over tactics the night before the match with us. And I was sharing the room with Ronnie McKinnon. And we went to the room and Ronnie says to me, he says, I thought you kept telling me that his jokes team is a good manager. I says, he is. He says, a good manager. He says, how the hell can he play a centre and a half with a number nine in his back? <laughs> <laughs> big, big, big joke played Ron Yates with a number nine in his back. No, I said, the, the, the number does the matter, Ronnie. <laughs> oh. go, going back to you being a manager, John, would you have loved to come into Murray Park? We're here today, but would you have loved to have come in here and had these facilities as a manager and a player? I think anybody would. I mean, uh, especially here in Scotland, these facilities are second to none. Uh, even, even, well, even in the last 18 years since I came back to the club, the first teams trained at places like Jordan Hill College and uh, the rugby ground and Step. Steps University place uh, was, was never their own. Um, but I think I think from for the for the uh, what would you say the the standard of the club here. I mean, every every European club that comes here, I would offer them this as a training facility, because some of their players will come here and their eyes are broken wide, because you never know when you want to, in this day and age when you might want to buy one of these players. So you, you've got a great facility to show them it. But I think I think basically for well for our first team they've got. The facilities for the first team is fabulous, but for the kids, I mean, the kids come in here at ten o'clock, at, at uh, ten years of age, and, and they walk into these facilities. I mean, they, they must think they've landed in, yeah. in Disney World. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're talking about all the strong leaders within the, the club. Your chairman, how's your relationship with Mr. Murray? Fabulous. The, chair, the chairman, the chairman has been absolutely magnificent to me. Not only in bringing me back to the club, but uh, in the way that uh, he's looked after me since I came back. Uh, he's been... There's nobody could have done any more for me than what, what he's done. He's, 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 I've got the greatest respect for him in every way. He, he, and not being who I was or that, but I, I think he's, uh, he, it's a pleasure to work for the man, the way he treats you. You, you know what it's like here. If you if you lose a game, you're only you're only one game away from a crisis. The old firm clubs, but I can understand some of the comments that's made by people uh, about the chairman. I don't think that a great deal of supporters will, will, will realise how good he's been for this club, and they won't realise it until he's away, and it'll be too late. I mean, the, the amount of times that he's done things for this club, I've seen it firsthand. It's been unbelievable. Unbelievable. And, I mean, Abramovich, Abramovich is okay, but David Murray's done things for this club, which in, in a place like Scotland, honestly, people wouldn't understand it. They wouldn't understand it. They'll, know, they'll know miss him until he's away. You spoke about very few managers being at Rangers, but just over the last couple of years, you've had Alec McLeish, Paul Le Guin, and now Walter Smith. Mm -hmm. And you've been seeing them all. What's all their, their qualities? 
They've all got different qualities. They're all different. They're, the three of them are different completely. I think it was difficult for Paul Le Guin. I, I think basically he's, he, he's a good manager. I just, I just think that he, he miscalculated what's needed in Scottish football. Do you think if he had leaned on something like yourself, like what, the way Dick Advocate did, that would have helped him? Well, it wasn't for the want to offer, and I can assure you that on my part, but he was a very private man. As the years have gone on, I think Sandy Jardin does more of that now. Uh, and I, I, to be honest, I don't, know, I don't know how much he was involved with Sandy or Sandy was involved with him, but he certainly wasn't, in, they weren't, he wasn't Sandy wasn't involved the way I was with the Cadwick cut. And I think somebody like him needed it, you know. But he had two or three guys around the bottom, he brought two or three guys with him, that was a different thing. But they've all got something different to give, you know. It's, it's no easy managing a mm -hmm. no for him team. And Walter coming back? Well, I think Walter steadied the ship up very quickly. You know, I think uh, him and uh, bringing Kenny uh, was a good thing and bringing uh, Koisty because they re the, the, they've resurrected a belief in the club that was there when they were here these years ago. We had to get back on an even keel. It, it, the, 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 the ship's been steady, but Walter's brought a few players in. Uh, we're doing all right. We're doing okay. I mean, actually, doing better than okay, because if, if we had taken at the start of the season as being where we are in the league and being where we are in the Champions League, you'd have, you'd have bitten somebody's hand off to get that. But Walter's an experienced guy. You know, He knows that there's a long time to go in this season. And uh, we'll just keep plugging away. You've been a player, manager a director, you've been part-time, full-time. Is there any point where you will walk away from this club for good? I know you've got grandchildren, you love your golf, mm. now. is there any, ever going to be a day where you don't come back in to say, I brought some money Park? Well, I'm part-time now, uh, and I, but I still have to go to all the first-team games as being a director. I've always promised myself one thing, that I would never become a burden to the club by being here and not being able to contribute in some way or another. Uh, and I think at times, well, I've, I've done most of my shift now. Uh, it's up to others now that's fallen to carry on the traditions of the club. It'll break my heart, but I don't, I mean, I'm realistic enough to know that I can't go on forever. And I don't think it'd be right if I went on forever. So there'll be some time in the future that I'll step back completely, I think. Uh, I'll never, lose, I'll never lose my interest in the club, but uh, I think as you get to get... Like I said, I had that wee scare a few years ago with my, my heart. Your health's very, very important to you, and uh, I appreciate that now. You know, and, 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 and at times nowadays, you say to yourself, well, should I be doing that, should I be doing that, you know? Uh, like getting back at four o'clock in the morning with you the other day there, isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it good for your, your looks? And drink some it. red wine? Uh, oh, no, I didn't touch that. But no, no, it, it's, whatever happens, let me put it this way, whatever happens, I'll always look upon it as being a, a privilege to have worked for this club. And uh, there'll be no grouse, grousing for me when I do leave. Um, but I just, I, if, I just, if I hope for one thing, there's a lot of people throughout the history of the club set examples by putting certain things in place and that, you know, all the way through to our chairman now. And I think that for the next hundred years, I hope that I hope that certain people come along and continue. No, always no about all the things, but because you, you've got to modernise as well. But I hope they can take some of the traditions along with them because it's a lot of these traditions that so many so many of the Ranger supporters uh, associate themselves with. So, and that's what makes us a different football club for many others.